The Roaring Twenties were many things. In the US, we see it as an era associated with decadence, music, and an almost hedonistic joy of life. And across the Atlantic, the widespread fervor of the post-war world led to remarkable discoveries and statistics in England. After all, what's more indulgent than sharing a cup of afternoon tea? Perhaps sharing many cups, as one guest, one lady tastes the tea, before declaring whether the milk was poured into the tea or the tea was poured into the milk. If, hypothetically, this tea-tasting lady guessed which came first correctly, does that mean that she truly holds divine tea powers, or at least a neat little party trick, or did her bluff avoid getting called merely by chance? Perhaps the guest who took the most interest in the lady tasting tea's claims of chamomile-flavored clairvoyance, which I have no idea if the tea was chamomile, I just like the alliteration, was one Sir Ronald Fisher. In fact, Fisher took such an interest in this little bit of party fun that he wrote an entire book, The Design of Experiments, outlining all the possible confounding variables that would render the lady's claims null. Firstly, if given a singular cup of tea, the lady would have a 50% chance of either being right or of being wrong. The singular trial could not possibly be proof that she can taste the difference in milk tea or tea milk. A comparison can be made here to a child taking a test. Say, for example, you're extremely worn out and tired from a busy few weeks and don't have time to keep up with the course's material. Come test day, you meet your reckoning and walk out, questioning whether you even spelled your name right at the top of the paper. Typically, you're a good student, clever and whatnot, but then there was work, and a project for another class, and car repairs, and being invited to a random tea party in England that you just couldn't miss because who knows what might happen at those. Would it be fair for the teacher to make that one test the deciding factor of your grade? Well, depends on the professor, I suppose. But at the very least, one thing you can count on is that your grade on one test would not be deterministic of your overall intelligence. Anyways, in our school grade example, we find the importance of repeated trials. While yes, taking multiple samples is useful in determining whether or not a lady can taste the differences in tea, it is also key to countless branches of science. In biology and chemistry and physics, the laws of our existence have been meticulously evaluated over and over again through countless trials before any degree of truthfulness can be assigned. Thus did Fisher's work revolutionize the scientific method. Suddenly, data mattered just as much as results. Previously, scientists and researchers would publish their findings, but only include data that supported their claims, cherry-picking their truth. Experiments lacked structure in that some proceeded without control variables, leading to a tangled mess of data that said little about what was being studied other than basal observations. Over 90 years of data on crop yields was collected by the Rothamsted Agricultural Experimental Station on the most impactful fertilizers to use, yet the results of all those years of collection were random at best. When Fisher managed to unweave some of the data and discover that the fertilizers had a negligible effect on crop production compared to weather and climate conditions, thus sending nine years of data into the gutter, at least in regards to his original goal, it also spurred him to introduce the idea of scientists creating mathematical models explaining the relationship between different points of data and different outcomes. In other words, what could affect what and to what extent, which gives rise to the idea of controls in order to isolate the data we mean to collect. There's a quote from John Milton circa 1644 in his work Areopagitica regarding the nature of truth. He states that pieces of truth are torn asunder. While each person might grasp a fragment of truth and hold that close to them as the truth, it is only by collecting more and more fragments, and thus more points of view, more data, more insight, can they come closer to seeing 
an objective truth, if such a thing can even be obtained. Areopagitica was written almost 300 years prior to Fisher's work, and I've no doubt that thinkers from earlier periods have said the same things. Still, we must credit Fisher for his accomplishments in standardizing that mode of thought and allowing us to grasp yet another piece of the truth. Chapter 2 begins with the question of where the beginnings of the statistical model appeared in science. Author David Salzberg suggests that this is traced back to the 1890s to Carl Pearson, an English mathematician who is frequently credited with establishing the discipline of mathematical statistics. Although Pearson received his doctorate in political science in Germany, his passions lay elsewhere in philosophy of science and the nature of mathematical modeling. This fact is illustrated by the publication of his book, The Grammar of Science, which remains relevant today with its modern insights into the history of philosophy of science and scientific methodology. To contextualize the importance of Pearson's work and the appearance of the statistical model, it is important to understand that the view of science at the turn of the century was still largely deterministic. However, Pearson recognized that the measured data obtained from experimental results yields in a distribution of numbers. Each experiment's outcomes are random, but statistical models can help make sense of the math behind that uncertainty. As such, by applying a mathematical formula to a distribution, Pearson saw that one can determine the likelihood of an observed number being assigned a specific value. In the past, before technology was as advanced as it is now, this unpredictability and randomness in data was chalked up to faulty instruments and imprecise measurements. Now, formulas describe the deviations between observed and predicted values in data as insignificant error, which eventually yielded the normal distribution. It was Pearson who discovered a group of distribution functions known as the Pearson system, which he described with what, with what are now known as parameters. The parameters are made up of four numbers, the mean, standard deviation, symmetry, and kurtosis, or how far rare measurements scatter from the mean. Pearson boldly claimed that the only reality in science was the probability distribution and the math which makes sense of observed randomness. Now, around the same time, Sir Francis Galton, a wealthy Englishman who became well known for discovering the fingerprint, was studying the patterns of numbers in biology. However, to do so, he had to set up a biometrical lab bio for life, and metric for measurement. One such experiment he conducted in his lab was measuring the height of parent and child in order to answer the question, is there a formula to predict the height of kids if one only knows the height of their parent? It is through this experiment that Galton stumbled upon the phenomenon of regression to the mean. He observed that very short fathers more often than not had taller sons, while very tall fathers had shorter sons, tending toward the average height. This phenomenon maintained stability so that, as a whole, the average heights of the human population remain the same through generations. This trend is surprisingly intuitive through reasoning. Galton realized logically that if very tall dads had sons which were also very tall on average, then some of those sons would have to be shorter than them and some would have to be taller. This group of sons who were taller than them in turn averaged an average height greater than that of their fathers, resulting in a subsequent taller generation of sons and so on and so forth. The same pattern would follow with very short dads, leading to a human race that tends towards its extremes. 
With his measurements, Galton discovered a specific mathematical model for this relationship, which he named the coefficient of correlation. In 1897, Pearson took over Galton's lab to cal calculate the parameters of distribution of human measurements. Soon thereafter, in 1901, Pearson, alongside Galton and Ralph Raphael Weldon established a scientific journal which would publish Pearson's idea in the context of biological data. They collected such data across the globe, seeking to demonstrate how environmental changes might be reflected in shifts of the distribution parameters in order to prove Darwin's evolutionary theories. After 10 years, Pearson was the only surviving member of the trio, as Galton passed away in 1911 and Weldon having long passed in a skiing accident. Pearson took liberty with the journal, investigating with mathematics whatever topic was interesting to him. Through his investigations, Pearson developed the goodness of fit test, which is the statistical tool which determines how well an observed frequency distribution matches an expected theoretical distribution. Today, we look back at Biometrica as a pioneering journal with a storied history that has significantly contributed to the development and dissemination of statistical methods in biology making it a cornerstone in the field of biostatistics. It continues to be a respected publication that influences research and practice in these areas. Moreover, the Pearsonian revolution of distribution functions and parameters is still relevant today in almost all aspects of science. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Guinness Brewing Company of Dublin, Ireland set out to hire the top Oxford and Cambridge University graduates in chemistry in order to develop scientific techniques into the brewing process at the company. This recruitment included that of a young man known as William Seeley Gossett who specialized in chemistry and mathematics. During Gossett's time at the Guinness Brewing Company, his skills in mathematics helped him make significant contributions in the process of brewing, which led him to become qualified to manage the company's entire Greater London operations. With Gossett's mathematical discoveries in the brewing process at Guinness, he helped create a precise method which would allow the company to create a constant result for their products. In 1904, Gossett published a paper which discussed his findings. He mentioned that the mathematical problem which needed to be solved in the process of brewing was finding an accurate measure of the concentration of yeast cells used in the preparation of fermenting the mash. This was due to the fact that the yeast was constantly multiplying as it is a live organism, and it was important to find an accurate measurement of yeast as it would determine the quality of the beer. After the examination of data, Gossett concluded that the measurement of the yeast cells could be modeled by Poisson distribution, which is a discrete probability distribution. However, it was against policy at Guinness for employees to publish work due to the risk of losing valuable company information, which had been done before. During the time, Gossett had also befriended a fellow mathematician named Carl Pearson, who was a current editor for the journal Biometrica. Both of the men decided to post Gossett's work to Biometrica, but under a pen name known as Student. In the two following years from this event, Gossett went on a year-long leave of absence studying under Pearson. Over time, Student's collection of work became a significant contribution to the world of statistics, including what's known as Student's Tea. 
The Discovery of Students' Tea was published in one of Gossett's papers in 1908 known as The Probable Error of the Mean, which to this day many scientists and statisticians are grateful for. Initially, Gossett was faced with the problem of dealing with small samples in opposition to Pearson's work who dealt with large samples of data, assuming that it would solve all of the parameters without any errors. Through Gossett's findings, he discovered that the exact values of all four parameters of the ratio was not needed. Rather, the estimated values of the first two parameters could lead you into a known distribution despite the whereabouts of the data or the actual value for the standard deviation. If this discovery had not been made, Analysts today would have had to infinitely estimate the values of all four parameters and estimate its four parameters without concluding to the actual calculation they needed. Several years later, Gossett was introduced to a high achieving math student from Cambridge University named Ronald Aylmer Fisher. Gossett would later become an intermediary between his two friends, Pearson and Fisher. Fisher had written a paper where he redid the work by student in the 1908 paper and discovered an error Gossett had made within it. After it was shown to Gossett, Gossett had proceeded to send the work to Pearson, stating that Fisher had created a new criterion of probability. These findings, as well as several other findings done by Fisher, would later be presented in Biometrica, published by Pearson. In retrospect, Gossett was a very influential man in the world of statistics, and he led many other mathematicians who would also create major contributions in the same field later on. So this chapter focuses on Ronald Aylmer Fisher. Fisher was born February 17, 1890 in East Finchley, London. Growing up, he was very sickly and in poor health and was also very lonely, and he had very severe vision impairment, and due to this, doctors advised him to stay away from artificial light, which would affect his um, vision. From a young age, around six, he was fascinated by astronomy and mathematics, specifically mathematics for the sake of this chapter. Um, and by ages seven and eight, he was already attending popular lectures given by Sir Robert Ball. Growing up, his teachers and schoolmasters would teach him with a lot of visual aids, which led him to having a more profound grasp on geometry than the average person, so much so that his way of viewing certain math problems was illegible to other mathematicians and would later on um, get him questioned a lot because his methods of viewing certain math problems and formulas was very different um, from the average, average mathematician back then. Um, he entered the University of Cambridge at in 1909 and rose to the honorable title of Wrangler in 1912. A feat only a few students could accomplish uh, through a series of written and oral math exams. Um, only a few students, probably one or two, would usually get this title a year, or sometimes not at all. As an undergraduate, he wrote his first scientific paper, which was a co compilation of complicated um, it, it, it iterative formulas which were interpreted in terms of multidimensional ge 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 geometric space and he had effectively shown that what seemed like a daunting compu computation method was just a simple consequence of geometry. Uh, Fisher, even after graduation, he stayed a year past and decided to study statistical uh, mechanics and quantum theory which seemed to be a good uh, call on his end as by 1913 his, the stats revolution entered the physics realm to reveal new ideas so um statistics was taking off around this time uh, after his education was finished fisher would hop from job to job first a t statistics office of an off of an investment company and then farm work in canada and then england around the beginning of the first world war um, however, due to his vision impairment, he couldn't uh, land a job in the military because it was too tedious for him to take on. 
So instead of a military job, he opted to be a school teacher teaching mathematics during the war during the war years. Though like his other employment ventures, this was also a very um, tedious, uh, hard task for him to keep because his temper with students was short and he couldn't really like get along with them because he had differences in understanding certain mathematical concepts as opposed to his younger students who didn't really understand what he was saying. So Fisher's head start into the statistical world was a bit rocky. During his undergraduate years at Cambridge, Fisher had a note published in the Biometrica, which is a peer-reviewed scientific journal published by the Oxford University Press. Through this, he got the opportunity to meet Carl Pearson, who would then go on to introduce the difficult problem of figuring out the statistical distribution of Galton's correlation coefficient. And what followed was simple. Fisher would dwell on the problem that was given to him by Pearson, put it through a geometrical geometric formulation, and then by the end of it, uh, or by the end of the same week, he would have the answer. Uh, he was submitted. To, he would submit his work to Pearson for publication. However, Pearson could not comprehend the mathematics and the work that um, Fisher put into computing this, um, you know, very difficult uh, problem. So he had to, so he had it sent to William Seeley Gossett, who also couldn't understand the work before him. Pearson would then turn to his workers in his biometrical laboratory to run through the problem and they too will agree with Fisher's general solution and overall they agreed with the generality that he had going on. Um, however, Pearson wasn't satisfied. He would not publish Fisher's wor work until um, a year after, so he held him off for a year to reduce the generality of his work. In the meantime, Pearson would have his calculators compute large tables of the distribution for selected values of the parameters um, of, uh, excuse me, of Fisher's work. After such an extensive waiting period, Fisher would get his work published, but as a footnote to one of the papers in which Pearson and his assistant um, conveyed the aforementioned tables. So his work wasn't directly published at all, it was just a little off to the side thing, and what was the main the main course, he would say, was um, Pearson's work that he did with his assistant regarding the tables and the parameters. This move by Pearson put Fisher behind as the average reader would pay more attention to Pearson's massive computational work than Fisher's, which seemed to just be an afterthought to Pearson's work. This subsequently led Fisher to uh, never work with Biometrica ever again. Uh, he would go on to work in journals that weren't normally associated with mathematics in the years after the Biometrica. Some of the journals were Journal of Agriculture's Agricultural Science, um, the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, uh, just to name a few. Some would say he did this, uh, or the people close to him would say he did this because he was cast away from the mainstream uh, math and statistics research by Pearson and his friends. Uh, he also failed to get himself published in another prestigious journal, so after that he just laid low and worked with um, obscure journals instead, uh, even going as far as to pay some of them to get his work published, so he was really desperate to get back out there, so he would, you know, pay to get himself out there. Um, earlier work by Fisher is very mathematical, however, some papers were outright, you know, did not have anything to do with math at all. One such case was a paper in which Fisher would speak on Charles Darwin's random adaptation theory and the ways in which it excuse me, in the ways in which was adequate to account for only the most sophisticated and atomical structures. Another one of his papers would speculate the evolution of sexual preference. All of this would prompt him to join the eugenics movement in 1917. He published a editorial in the Eugenics Review in which he would advocate for a national policy to quote unquote, increase the birth rate in the professional classes and among highly skilled artisans. Uh, and to act actively discourage births, um, births among the lower societal classes. So pretty typical eugenic stuff. He, he was worrying that um, by having the low classes reproduced, we might not pass on um, good genealogy to the future um, generations. The Second World War would further amplify Fisher's very obvious eugenics written theories and tangents. Uh, the, the need to push for selective human breeding was propelled by his fear of the aforementioned future generations possessing 
quote unquote poorer jeans and less of what he deemed were quote unquote better jeans of higher classes. There was also class genealogy, um, you know, eugenics going on over there. These theories would coincide with his political views and subsequently expel him from any war related work going forward that he, as he was deemed a fascist. So going forward, he was not, he was not involved with any of the war effort, anything to do with war. He was just shunned from it. Fisher was a curious force, unlike his former foe, or Carl Pearson. Pearson dabbled in socialism and Marxism, but never applied it to his arithmetic work. Or, or vice versa, he didn't apply um, his beliefs to his work, and he didn't apply his work to his beliefs. Whereas Fisher sought to unify eugenics with his unique mathematical lens. Fisher began his genealogy conquest by taking steps beyond... Uh, beyond um, Gregor Mendel's work. Uh, the exper he experimented with the new ideas of single cell influences on certain characteristics in living things and effects of neighboring genes. Despite there being scientific scientific advancements in the late 20th century to be able to read genes, there were still, ma there were still many discoveries to be made in the world of geneticism. However, we'll be looking at Fisher's contributions to the statistical, statistical side of things. Excuse me. Despite being cast aside by the mathematical community, Fisher would go on to finding purchase with the agricultural scientists instead. In 1925, Fisher would publish the first edition of his Statistical Methods for Research. The book would be available in 20 languages, 14 English edition ones, and the other, other six would be French, German, Italian, Japanese, Spanish, and Russian. The interesting thing about Fisher's book was that it was unlike other mathematical books. It lacked proof, which other books would relate, where other books would relate abstract ideas to one another to prove their methods and their theories alike. Fisher's didn't. His book began with a visionary discussion, how to create a graph of numbers and the ways in which that graph could be interpreted. To give an example of how to create a graph of numbers and the way that it, the graph could be interpreted, Fisher provided an example which, in which he would use his own infant son as, a, as an experimentation unit. The example in which he would demonstrate his methods was through the following scenario. The weight fluctuation of a newborn baby's first 13 weeks of life. The chapters following this example all consisted of methods on how to analyze data, uh, various formulas and examples and interpretations of said examples and vice versa. The formulas Fisher displayed had no mathematical origins, no justification, no proof to them either. The only directions or proof, quote unquote, that was in the book were, were how to apply the formulas onto a mechanical calculator. Perhaps its uniqueness with this lack of theoretical mathematics is what took the scientific community by storm but they were enamored with this book. Then came Swedish mathematician Harold uh, Kramer during the Second World War. He was closed off from much of the world at the time and thus dedicated most of his time to studying Fisher's statistical methods for research workers. Where Fisher lacked, Kramer made up for. In 1945, Kramer would publish the book providing formulas, uh, form, formal proofs excuse me, for much of what Fisher had written. This book would be called Mathematical Methods of Statistics. Most of Fisher's work would be left uh, out, however, which came as a surprise to L.J. Savage um, of Yale University in the 1970s, who had gone through many of Fisher's work, um, much of which had answers to problems that were considered unsolvable in the 1970s. So clearly Fisher was very much ahead of his time if he could solve or provide answers to problems um, decades after his passing. Still, in 1919, Fisher would once again abandon his failed venture as a school teacher to go on and inst instead attempt to have his next paper published, so he was back in the publishing realm. This paper was one of many wondrous works by R.A. Fisher, as it combined Galton's correlation coefficient with me uh, Men Mendelian hereditary heredity gene theory. Excuse me. Fisher went through much trial and error to get this, this paper published as well. He would get rejected by both the Royal Statistical Society and Pearson of Biometrica, who he had sworn he wouldn't go back to, but still did. Uh, no worry, however, because there was a publisher that would accept his paper, the Royal Society of Edinburgh. 
The only catch was they asked for authors to pay for their own publications, and so Fisher would do just that. Despite the denial to, uh, excuse me, the denial to publish his work, Carl Pearson was very much still in awe of Fisher and his mathematical prowess. So much so that he offered to take him in, take him on as chief statistician at the Galton Biometrical Laboratory. Fisher, however, would not take on that offer given by Pearson because he had a good insight on Pearson's dominance, at, dominance excuse me, as a chief statistician at the Galton Biometric Laboratory. Instead, he would work at an experimental station. Sir John Russell, who oversaw the Rothamsted uh, Agriculture Experimental Station, sought someone to analyze the station's 90 years of data. The station was initially established on a farm by a British fertilizer manufacturer. The farm had clay soil, which was not ideal for cultivation, until the owners figured out how to create quote unquote super fo uh, phos phosphate by mixing crushed stone with acid, which became profitable. These profits were reinvested in the station to develop new artificial fertilizer. Over nearly a century, the station conducted various experiments involving different combinations of mineral, mineral salts and strains of wheat, rye, barley, and potatoes. The outcomes of these experiments varied, but meticulous records were maintained, including daily rainfall temperature, data, weekly fertilizer application records, soil measurements, and annual harvest records, all stored in leather-bound notebooks. Sir John Russell decided to have the data be examined more systematically and inquire potential candidates. This is where Ronald Fisher comes in. Uh, Fisher was recommended for the task. Fisher would agree to the job offer, which pro promised a thousand pounds, even though there was no security of keeping that job past a year. And so Fisher would relocate his entire family to the rural area of nor to the rural area north of London. They rented a farm adjacent to the experimental station where his wife and sister-in-law would manage a vegetable garden and household chores. Fisher would put on his boots each day and walk through the fields to the Rothamsted Agriculture Experimental Station. Uh, he later referred to this work as quote unquote raking over the muck heap as he aimed to extract valuable insights and patterns from the extensive agricultural records. Chapter 5 of The Lady Tasting Tea starts with the author recalling his past, early in his career as a biostatistician. He takes a trip to the University of Connecticut and discusses problems with a professor there. As they talk, R.A. Fishers, whom I am currently drawing the portrait of, studies in crop variation is brought up. For specifically the first studies in crop variation, Fisher worked as the sole author. The amount of time it took for Fisher to calculate the amount of variations that could occur was at least eight months due to the technology of calculators they had back then. Though this presumed eight months does not account for the amount of time necessary for working out theoretical mathematics, planning analysis, as well as correcting any mistakes that occur throughout the whole process. Fisher took Galton's word and the idea of regression and established a mathematical relationship between the year and the wheat output of the given field. Pearson's idea of probability distribution became a formula connecting year to output. Fisher pulled the time trend of the wheat output and put them into several different pieces. One was a steady overall cut of output due to deterioration, the other was a slow long-term change that would take several years to go through each phase. The third was a group of much faster moving changes that would take into account the variations that would occur in the climate year to year. Fisher was initially confused by his analysis of the grain harvested from a field he used in the experiment. The only type of fertilizer used in the fields was animal feces, so the variation in the yield was not due to experimental fertilizer. The long-term deterioration was due to the soil being depleted and nutrients missing from the animal feces, and there were effects from differing rainfall patterns as well from the year-to-year -year change. There was improvement starting in 1894, to which dropped after 1901. Fisher then discovered that prior to 1876, young boys would go out into the fields to pick weeds, 
and that it was common in England to see children in the middle of the day simply going through wheat and plucking weeds. In 1876, however, the Second Education Act was put into place, making attendance in school required, which led to the young boys no longer being able to go into the fields to pick out weeds, and the weeds began to flourish in the fields. In 1894, a nearby girls' school ended up replacing what the young boys did. Their schoolmaster was quite the fan of outdoor activities to build up the health of his students, so he arranged to have his students go out into the fields to pull out the weeds on Saturdays and in evenings. When the schoolmaster died, so did these outdoor activities. So when the girls ended up becoming more sedentary, the weeds again came back to the field. In the second study on crop variation, a different set of experiments is described and used. They were no longer applying a single experimental fertilizer across an entire field. Instead, they were cutting the fields into smaller plots. Every plot was divided into rows of plants, and every row within a single plot was given different treatments. Fisher's analysis of variance is a method for separating out the effects of different treatments in a well-designed scientific experiment. The analysis of variance shows up for the first time in the second studies in crop variation. In 1922, Fisher gets published in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society for the first time. In 1924, to the same journal, he publishes a much longer and more general paper, and comments on the paper as well as one that is related. These papers are attempts to reconcile with the aid of the new concept of degrees of freedom. This new concept of degrees of freedom was related to Fisher's direct geometric insights and his ability to put mathematical problems in terms of multidimensional geometry. The third studies in crop variations follows an article of a total of 53 pages. It contains foundations for modern statistical methods that are used in economics, medicine, chemistry, computer science, sociology, astronomy, pharmacology, basically any field that requires the ability to establish relative effects of large numbers of interconnected causes. In 1947, Fisher was invited to give a series of talks on the BBC radio network about science, the nature of science, and as well as scientific investigation. Chapter 6 of David Salzberg's book Lady Teasting Tea is titled The Hundred Years Flood. This chapter first introduces flood as an example. We know that once in 100 year floods are the most unpredictable, and perhaps no one can plan for such a rare flood. Statistical model using floods as observations. Statisticians can't estimate when flooding will happen again. As Salzberg's explanation, Hypothesis testing is an important statistical tool used to make decisions or allow statisticians to draw conclusions about a population based on sample data there is a scene involving cotton. Production. Here LHC Tippett is mentioned in his published paper. He is a statistician at the British Cotton Industry Research Association which is trying to use modern scientific methods to improve the manufacture of cotton thread and cloth. One of the toughest problems they encountered was the strength of the newly spun cotton thread. The tension required to break one wire varies from one wire to another, even if the wires are exposed to the same environment. Tippett conducted some careful experiments, examining threads at different levels of tension under a microscope. He discovered that the breaking of a thread depends on the strength of the weakest fiber in it. Unable to resolve the problem, Tippett asked Carl Pearson to take a year off from school, which was granted. Salzberg then discusses the two main themes in this chapter, extreme value distribution. Salzberg first explained what an extreme value distribution is. We can record the height of floods every year, and then we can predict the most likely height of a 100-year flood. This process involves hypothesis testing where we make decisions and draw conclusions about annual flood value measurements. As a result, Tippett's distribution affects the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which can calculate bank heights, and the Environmental Protection Agency, which can set emission standards. The cotton industry can also identify cotton production factors that influence the strength distribution of the weakest fibers. 
On the next topic, Emil J. Gumbel, professor of engineering at Columbia University, has published a definitive article on the subject titled Extreme Statistics. Political Murder The Nazis were rampant in Germany in the late 1920s and early 1930s. The Nazi party was the official political party of the time. Anyone who criticized the Nazi party was violently attacked, often in the open streets. One of Gumbel's friends was attacked and killed in this way. There were many witnesses to the murder who were said to be able to identify the murderer. However, the court ultimately concluded that there was insufficient evidence and acquitted him. Gumbel was shocked as he watched the trial. Watching as the court continued to miss all evidence and witnesses fail to convict, Gumbel then began investigating other cases related to the murder. He then concluded that judges had been subverted by the Nazis and that cases involving Nazis could go unpunished. Gumbel collected many cases, interviewed witnesses, and documented the false dismissals of murder cases. He published his findings in Four Years of Political Murder and the Causes of Political Murder. He tried to create a political group against the Nazis, but many people were afraid to join him. In 1933, the Nazis were powerful. Gumbel was attending a mathematics conference in Switzerland. He wanted to rush back to Germany to fight against this new government. His friends dissuaded him and told him he would be captured and killed by the Nazis. Gumbel and his family moved to an uninhabited area in southern France, but the Nazis put them on their enemy list and their lives are threatened. Gumbel was subsequently censured by Washington and eventually removed from office. When Gumbel and his family came to the United States, he was offered a position at Columbia University. So this is a real-life application in Salzburg's explanation, with reference to real-world examples such as Tippett's cotton industry and Gumbel's collection of cases. These different areas illustrate how hypothesis testing can be used. Uh, the Royal Statistical Society of England invites speakers and sponsors these meetings in which they publish articles based off the speaker's presentation if it represents a significant increase in natural knowledge. It is an honor reserved for only the most prominent workers in the field. During the discussion, the speaker will give his presentation followed along with comments to which they will respond to. On December 18, 1934, the honor of presenting was given to Professor R.A. Fisher. Fisher, who was finally having his genius recognized, became elected as a fellow of the prestigious Royal Society. On this day, he presented a paper titled The Logic of Inductive Inference. After Fisher's presentation, the first discussant was Professor A.L. Bowley, who gave praise and thanks to Fisher's work. He mentioned in his comment, this is an appropriate occasion to say that I, and all statisticians with whom I associate, appreciate the enormous amount of zeal he has brought to the study of statistics, the power of his mathematical tools, the extent of his influence here in America and elsewhere, and the stimulus he has given to what he believes to be correct applications of mathematics. That leads us to our next person, Carl Pearson, who led the Galton Biometrical Laboratory. After his retirement, the department was split into two, to which his son, Egon Pearson, was named chairman of the diminished biometric department, and Fisher became the chairman for, of the new department of eugenics. Fisher disliked Egon Pearson due to his dislike for his father as well as Jersey Neyman. Uh, the Fisherian versus the Personian view of statistics. So Fisher used abstract mathematical formulas to estimate true distribution and Fisher's proposed tools of analysis would minimize the degree of error better than any other tool, and therefore, in the 1930s, 
Fisher's method seemed to be the better way. However, in the 1970s, the Pearsonian view made a comeback. This would lead to arguments on which method was better for statistics. Fisher proposed several criteria of a good statistic, including consistency, unbiasedness, and efficiency. So for consistency, the more data you have, the greater the probability that the statistic you calculate is close to the true value of the parameter. Unbiasedness being if you use a particular statistic many times on different sets of data, the average of those values of the statistic should come close to the true value of the parameter. And efficiency being values of the statistic will not be exactly equal to the true value of the parameter but the bulk of a large number of statistics that estimate a parameter should not be too far from the true value. The more Fisher worked out in mathematics, the more he realized that the methods used by Carl Pearson produced statistics that were not necessarily consistent and were often biased. Thus, Fisher proposed something called the Maximum Likelihood Estimator, otherwise known as MLE. MLE swept through the mathematical statistics community and became the major method for estimating parameters. Uh, then came iterative algorithms. One of the earliest iterative mathematical methods emerged for during the Renaissance. Now, as computers have evolved, so has much more complicated likelihoods. However, we can all agree that Fisher's approach to statistical estimation is triumphant. During his time, his methods completely beat out Pearson's methods and maximum likelihood triumphed. All right, so this is, my name is Archer. I hope my microphone is working. Otherwise, the audio is going to be very bad, but still listenable. So this is chapter ninth, which the story starts in 1930, where a group of many of these great mathematicians come together. And they're all trying to prove one theory which has been pivotal to most big theories at the time regarding statistics. And it's called the Central Limit Theorem. And it essentially is a guide that allows you to say like, oh, if my population has all these characteristics, then in turn, I can say that the Central Limit theory Theorem proves true. Now, what does this mean? It means that if distribution is normal, and once you've proved that that distribution is normal, you can really do a lot of interesting things with the actual population and make a lot of assumptions that you previously couldn't really do. Now, the, the thing is, with a non... Uh, uh, ah, I'm sorry. You can do a lot of assumptions that you couldn't do previously with a non normal distribution and people have been doing that for a long time it was like generally accepted but nobody had actually proven the central limit theorem which is kind of a big deal like people were doing statistics but it wasn't all that accurately accurate so in the 1930s all these mathematicians got together and they were like now we're gonna prove this like we know that this thing exists therefore there has to be proof somewhere just nobody has found it, and we'll do it. The thing is, a slight inconvenience, like a world war comes around and the communication become, become uh, the communication between all the countries just like are not that good. You know, that's kind of usually what wars do, and they can't do anything because yeah, the world's just a mess, and you can't do anything across borders. Many of them were from different countries and. Yeah. Now, in Europe, eventually, the central, the central limit theorem, goddamn it, why speaking English is so hard, is proven by this man of, named Lindbergh Levi. And they, like, they are actually proved and independent of each other. Like, they're proven independently of each other at the same place in the same time. I'm sorry. Lindbergh is one guy, and Levi is another guy. And they're actually two different people, but they by coincidence, prove it in different times, uh, different places at a similar time, which is pretty cool. I wonder if we're ever going to really know who did first and who we should give credit to. I mean, both are really smart, so. Um, and they weren't actually working together, which is fun fact. 
Now, what allowed for these conditions to work as the proof of the central limit theorem? So if these conditions were true, then you could also assume that the central limit theorem would be true, which then would also assume that the population is normally distributed. And now jumping on to 1948, Hoffering. Ho Hofting? Hoffing? I'm not good at German names. Um, who seems to be really the star of the show, to say. Like, he simplified the Lindbergh slash Levi conditions. In a way that, like, by proving that the U statistics was equally valid of a proof of the actual Lindbergh-Levi statistics, which made things so much easier. So by doing this, he actually had a simpler formula that could be simply done, had less complicated math, and was more used in the everyday calculations. So it was a lot more, a lot more easier, unlike grammar, um, for the average person and average engineer and common everyday people and not just these mathematical geniuses to apply it and it later became like really pivotal in estimation theory and he actually regarded it as a non-parametric founder in statistics non-par non-parametric founder nah, whatever and he goes on to like I guess we should start with like yeah like oh my god this man was born in 1914 in Finland, and he went to high school, and then in 1933 he studied math in Berlin. But the thing is, there was something going on in Berlin in 1933. Like, uh, these guys named Nazis were kind of taking over the place, and many of his teachers would just disappear for, like, being Jewish, or Jewish sympathizers, or whatever that means, and the school's cleansed from all these people that the Nazis didn't like, just to show how, like, yeah, it's it's crazy how everybody in that period was affected, like by this, by this war and these people. Like, now, at the whole time when he's working in Berlin through the 1940s, so he's living right through all the Nazi oppression in the mid-war period, and he wasn't actually a German citizen, meaning he was not not regarded as as good as the other people there, because like you know how the Nazis think, and. He had to work part-time for this journal guy named Harold, Harold Ge, I'm not gonna remember the, the last name, I'm sorry. And he was the editor of the journal, and Harold basically says that he's like, like, well, if you don't do something for the German military, they're gonna force you to work in like, and fight in the combat. So he screened out for combat, and it turns out that Hoff, Hoff, that, that guy had diabetes and he's cleared from combat, but he still has to work and why would diabetes not allow somebody to go to combat? I don't know. Well, he offered this position in applied mathematics for the German army, which is way better than being in the front line, and he declines it on complete moral grounds that he's against the idea and he can't do it. Which I totally approve. Now, so if he goes, now later he goes and actually flees from Germany in 1945 with um, with his mother and he starts working in North Carolina, like the University of North Carolina in 1940, I remember if it was 44 or 46, and like because of all that and the the um, central because this theorem like the use of statistics until today is very important of course now this is a brief summary of chapter 9 and I know I had a good amount of dic dictations uh, like like speaking mistakes all along and I hope this was legible I hope this video worked and I hope it was understandable I'm recording this late on uh, Sunday and things have been so hectic. I'm sorry for uh, delivering this late, but it was the quickest that I could get it done. So, have a good one. Chapter 10. Delving into the goodness of fit. In the 1980s, the world of mathematics was stirred by the emergence of the chaos theory. This intriguing model proposed a deterministic perspective suggesting that phenomena could be understood through fixed patterns rather than their inherent randomness. 
This was a significant deviation from the then dominant statistical thinking, which was focused on understanding the parameters that govern the distribution of measurements. Before the rise of the statistical revolution, science focused on the measurements made or the physical events that led to those measurements. The deterministic approach held the belief that refining measurements could lead to a clearer understanding of the physical reality being examined. In contrast, the statistical approach acknowledged that parameters of a distribution might not always correspond to a tangible physical reality. They could be estimated with some inherent error regardless of the precision of the measuring system. An example is understanding gravity. The deterministic approach believes in a fixed gravitational constant, while the statistical perspective emphasizes understanding the variance in measurements for this constant. Edward Lorenz, a prominent figure in chaos theory, posed an intriguing question through his lecture titled, Does the Flap of a Butterfly's Wings in Brazil Set Off a Tornado in Texas? He introduced the idea that chaotic mathematical functions could be extremely sensitive to their initial conditions. A minuscule variation at the beginning could lead to a vastly different outcome later. This concept, termed the butterfly effect, was praised by many as a profound truth. However, it's essential to note that the existence of such cause and effect has not been scientifically proven and remains a topic of debate. Chaos theory suggests the numbers produced by deterministic formulas could seemingly manifest as random. This observation was grounded in the works of Henry Poincaré in the early 20th century. Poincaré attempted to understand complex differential equations by plotting successive number pairs. Over time, as more data points were plotted, a discernible pattern began to emerge, challenging the concept of pure randomness. However, a significant shortcoming of chaos theory was the absence of an acceptable means for measuring the goodness of fit between observed data and theoretical patterns. Carl Pearson's introduction of the goodness of fit test marked a pivotal point in the study of statistics. This test was designed to compare observed values with their predicted counterparts. Pearson's test laid the foundation for hypothesis testing or significance testing. This methodology allowed researchers to compare multiple mathematical models of reality and employ data to reject or support them. A practical application of this was illustrated through the Lady Tasting Tea experiment where hypothesis testing was employed to assess the lady's ability to accurately distinguish between two different tea preparation methods. The results of such tests, while making certain hypotheses unlikely, did not necessarily rule out alternative hypotheses. R. A. Fisher's work in statistics sought to provide clarity and precision in the study of significance testing. He introduced the concept of p-values to evaluate the significance of results. While Fisher was confident about the significance and importance of p-values, his work wasn't free from criticism. Fisher's dismissal of the harmful effects of smoking, based on his statistical analyses, drew sharp criticism. Jersey Neyman's knowledge of statistics is a testament to his perseverance and self-education. Despite facing adversities of World War I and limited academic resources, Neyman self-educated to become a pioneering figure in statistics. He was able to present complex theoretic ideas in a simple, easy-to-understand manner. A significant part of Neyman's legacy is his collaborative work with Egon Pearson, Carl Pearson's son. Together, Neyman and Pearson expanded upon the foundational ideas in hypothesis testing, introducing a more structured framework that allowed for clearer decision-making in statistical analyses. The evolution of statistical thought, reviewed in Chapter 10, showcases the interplay between deterministic and statistical perspectives. It emphasizes the importance and process for continuing to refine statistical methods through theoretical thought and analysis. Hi everyone, my name is Nicholas Herrera and I'm going to be walking you through chapter 12 uh, called The Confidence Trick. Alright, so this, uh, this chapter starts off with uh, us talking about AIDS in the 1980s uh, when it was something, you know, new and something we didn't really know about too much. Um, 
we start off with, uh, you know, health officials wanting to know how many uh, people were infected at the time. And there wasn't really a, a way of knowing that uh, because, you know, um, you know, usually uh, what happens is uh, in order to, you know, people to end up being infected with AIDS, uh, it starts off with HIV. So uh, at the point of infection of HIV, there's like a latency period until you get AIDS. Uh, so um, at that point, uh, what we call it is a latency period. And, uh, you know, like I said, there wasn't a way of knowing um, how many people would be infected or, you know, how many people were infected at the time uh, until there was like this group of uh, hemophiliacs that um, that, you know, health officials were able to, uh, you know, uh, end up making a parameter or an average or an estimate for the parameter uh, of, you know, the latency period between, you know, the, the point of infection to the point of uh, contracting AIDS. Um, what they found out was that it was around uh, 5.7 years. And, uh, you know, since that's just uh, an average number, it doesn't really give you much. So what they wanted to find out was an uh, estimate interval uh, to, you know, uh, make sure, you know, just to see uh, what that would be like. Um, so the interval that they ended up coming up with was uh, an interval between 3.7 years and 12.4 years. Uh, the issue with this, though, is that um that's a very wide you know estimate interval so it's basically telling you that you know uh at most people could live 20 years or more uh you know extra without dying and um you know at least people would have, you know, contract AIDS within 20 years. Um, so, you know, that's not a very good way of, you know, making estimate intervals. Um, there's like another example in the 1980s where, uh, you know, a committee uh, wanted to see if the fluorocarbons that were being used in aerosol sprays uh, you know, how damaging they were to the ozone layer uh, of the earth. Um, so one of the chairman of, uh, of the, of the, uh, committee, they, um, what they ended up doing instead of giving a yes or no answer was they ended up giving a probability distribution. And what that probability distribution showed was that uh, even in the lower end of the, uh, you know, um, interval, you would see that there was sufficient, um, you know, damage being done to the ozone layer, which, you know, uh, translates to, you know, uh, health concerns for, you know, humans. All right, so moving on, um, this gentleman right here, he goes by the name of Jersey Neiman. And in 1934, he presented his uh, paper to the Royal Statistical Society, uh, in which uh, he presented an idea of like a way to create in interval estimates and to see how accurate it is. Uh, that's what we nowadays call the confidence intervals. And, um, you know, at first, these confidence intervals, they face a lot of backlash. Uh, for example, one of the people present, his name was GM Boldy. Uh, he didn't really see the confidence intervals as, you know, kind of saw it as like too good to be true in a way. Um, but the thing is, uh, you know, other people had issues with this as well. Um, also, Ari Fisher. Uh, this gentleman right here, um, he believed that 
Neiman had stolen his idea of what he calls his fiducial probability. Um, the issue with that was that uh, when faced with, you know, more complicated uh, problems, uh, Fisher's fiducial probability, or I mean, just, yeah, probability, it would, uh, you know, break down in a way. But as we now know, uh, Neiman's confidence intervals are still being used to this day. Um, but the thing is, sometimes when we use our confidence intervals, so let's say that we have like a 95% confidence interval, and within that we have a 95% confidence, I mean a 95% probability. Uh, so, you know, we really don't, what does that probability actually mean? So, what Neiman wanted to, to clarify was that um, these confidence intervals should be used more of like as a process. Uh, so, you know, when you have a 95% confidence interval, you're not saying that it's then it's true 95% of the time. Uh, you're saying more that uh, within the 95% confidence intervals, uh, you can find that the true parameter lies within it 95% uh, of the time. And that's it for chapter 12.